All right, let's get started. My name is Kate Nielsen, and I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy, Legal Advocacy, and Research for AUW. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Shana Sabbath, Director of Fellowships and Grants, and a few other staff members behind the scenes helping out. We'll also be welcoming three fabulous panelists to share their perspectives and help guide our discussion. We'll meet them in a few minutes. As I'm sure you're all well aware through the news and your own lived experiences, right now Americans are struggling to deal with the dual economic and health crises. And as new variants of COVID rage, we are left with more questions and uncertainty. Striving for economic stability in an unstable time, it's critical to the well being of women and families. AUW is undertaking an ambitious initiative to determine what underserved women in New York City need to both survive and thrive in this difficult time. We're building on existing strands of work to bring forward, create concrete recommendations for policy and practice. AUW is a leader on closing the pay gap, annually publishing the seminal The Simple Truth About the Gender Pay Gap report, hosting free workshops across the country and online, to empower women to negotiate a fair paycheck, leading the Fair pay, Paycheck Fairness Act Coalition and engaging our 170,000 members and supporters to enact policy change at the federal, state, and local levels. We know that we can't shrink the gender pay gap without addressing the ways in which the pandemic is exacerbating inequality. During the summer of 2021, we published Pandemic Inequality, Latinas and the COVID-19 Experience. And we just conducted a survey of New York City women to understand and assess their needs during recovery. All of these initiatives help paint a picture of real world experiences and guide our responses. To complement these work streams, we think it's imperative to bring the workforce together into conversation. By creating spaces for employers, managers, and employees to come together, we can jointly forge a path and determine new policies that will work for everyone. Today is the second in a series of conversations to try to understand and get comfortable with issues around pay inequality. Last month, we convened a panel of employees to offer their perspectives. And after this panel discussion, we'll hold one more featuring leaders to discuss equal pay issues from their perspectives. We'll culminate this series by bringing all the groups together to help forge trust and reveal best practices for moving forward. For those of us who were able to join the last discussion, I spent some time up front discussing the gender pay gap and my colleague Lauren Hamaser talked about some findings from a survey we just con conducted on the economic security of New York City women during COVID. Over half a century after pay discrimination became illegal in the US, a persistent pay gap between men and women continues to hurt our nation's workers and national economy. Women working full-time in the U.S. are paid, still pay just 83 cents to every dollar earned by men, and the consequences of this gap affect women throughout their lives. The pay gap makes it harder for women to repay student debt and even follows women into retirement. As a result of lower lifetime earnings, they receive less Social Security and pensions. The COVID-19 pandemic has not spared women or helped the gender pay gap. In fact, the effects on women and their economic security were immediately apparent. While median earnings rose for both men and women working full-time in 2020, because that's a measure of earnings for those who still had a job and were working, median household income fell by 2.9% as millions lost their jobs. Also, the gender pay gap does not affect all women equally. Most women of color earn substantially less than white non-Hispanic men, as well as men of their same race or ethnicity. But in addition to the variation in the pay gap among races, the past year also brought about uneven job loss, which will impact the racial pay gaps for years to come. Between 2019 and 2020, workers of all races and genders lost jobs, but not equally. Asian and Hispanic women were hardest hit. But the bottom line is, no matter how you slice and dice the numbers, it adds up to lower pay, and more economic insecurity for women. To support our work on pay equity gen generally and to help understand the economic impact of COVID-19 specifically, we investigated how women in New York City metro region are coping with the economic fallout. At the end of the summer, we conducted a survey of over 700 women 
who are over 18 and living in New York City. It was a racially diverse survey with about 20% living with kids under the age of 12, a median age of 50, 56% with a household income less than $50,000, and a little over half working full-time. One key finding was the really stunning level of economic insecurity that women in New York City face. About a third of women report that their income isn't sufficient to provide all basic necessities, a third. That means that a third of women are making the choice between food, shelter, medical care, childcare, et cetera. But even if women are able to make basic, to meet their basic needs, more than half by various metrics that we see here still feel financially insecure. While 38% did lose some or all of their income during the pandemic, that's not sufficient to account for over the half of respondents who don't feel financially secure. So the question is, for women in New York, what would equal pay mean to them? Next slide, please. So we know that there's a pay gap and that has a lot of dimensions to it. And we also know that workers at every level would like that not to be the case. But how you think about the gender pay gap probably looks a little different depending on what role you hold. In our last discussion, we talked with employees who shared many different tips about how to get the conversation started and some tricks to combating pay inequality. Today's conversation is focused on the manager's role. Before I turn it over to Shana and our panel, I wanna share a few of the perspectives you all, the audience, have on the issue. <coughs> this will give you all a sense of the other people on this webinar and help our panelists think a little bit about who they're talking to. So in answer to the first question in the participant survey, the, man the managers who are joining us today were generally receptive to a lot of the different options that we presented, with the most popular ideas being offering flexibility to be remote or to start and end days at different times. Offering made more paid time off was also a popular response. Similarly, managers were very open to employees taking a host of steps to reduce pay inequality including negotiating their salary or a raise and asking for published salary brands and pay audits. And managers were very open to taking steps themselves with virtually every managerial respondent being open to regular pay audits and discontinuing the use of salary history in the hiring process, among other steps. All right, panel, I think that gives you a good sense of what the other folks on the call today are thinking about structurally and in their own individual lives. Thank you to those who filled out the survey. I'm excited to turn it over to Shana now to get this conversation rolling. Thank you so much, Kate. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. I'll be today's panel moderator. My name is Shana Sabbath. I'm Director of Fellowships and Grants at AEW. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues at AEW, including Kate Nielsen and others, for their contributions to AEW's groundbreaking research, outreach, and trainings that all have one goal in mind, to eliminate the pay gap, pay gap, because after all, we can't wait for the pay gap to close at the current rate of progress. That would mean waiting decades. And pay equity will remain a priority at AEW until this gap is eliminated, recognizing that the primary barriers of the pay gap are systemic and outside the control of many of those it affects the most, we take a multi-pronged approach to closing this gap, including, as Kate mentioned, focusing on advocacy related to federal and state legislation that would help close this gap and research to empower our advocacy with facts that we all need to draw attention to this persistent issue. We also do salary negotiation and trainings, including Work Smart Online. It's free. You can go to our website and look it up and our fellowships and grants awards, so that in the spaces where, despite the systemic issue, um, AEW can provide tools for women to empower themselves and each other. And our other efforts, including this webinar that seeks to remove one of the factors that helps the pay, pay gap thrive, and that is silence, and call attention to the severity of the gap and the ways people at all levels of an organization, company, or institution can combat it. So today we've heard about the big picture, the research that Kate Nielsen shared. 
the numbers and the data that describe what so many women, particularly women of color, experience. And now we're going to take a peek behind the curtain to see what women's experiences are like in the day-to-day -day lives of their careers and their insights on challenges to pay equity from a manager's lens in their industries, in their careers, at organizations and institutions of all sizes, and what they've done or have seen on the ground to combat this inequity. So our other panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to introduce you one by one, if you could pop on your camera so everybody could see you first. Dr. Sandra Hampton, an Associate Dean for General Education at a leading higher education institution in New Jersey. Also, Nupur Sutaria, a supply chain manager at a hardware tech company and recent AAW Selected Professions Fellow. Terry Huss Edwards, a program manager at a technology company and recent AAW Career Development Grantee. Thank you again so much for joining us today. To set the stage for this conversation, I want to share a story of an AEW fellow that shows how important this multifaceted approach to reducing the pay gap is to eliminate systemic issues while providing tools for women to reduce pay equity in their own lives. So this woman said, looking back at her career, she said, maybe it was a cultural or societal pressure, but I had a hard time negotiating. I felt diffident and greedy. Meanwhile, she routinely heard male colleagues threatening to leave the institution for another higher paying job offer unless they paid more. And in her words, she noted, there was systemic bias towards more effort to retain these male employees by matching their offers. And she wasn't aware of women getting the same treatment. So we can see there's often this push and pull of what's happening systemically and what may be within our own power to do to advocate for ourselves and for each other in the workplace. So let the, let's um, hear from our panelists now. I'd love to hear from, say, Dr. Hampton first. What barriers to equal pay do you see in your workplace? Hello, everyone. Um, so the one uh, issue that comes up to mind when we talk about um, inequity and equal pay and um, is the fact that in my experience, there is just lack of conversation about it, period. Um, in, in my environment. So that's one. So how can we really address something if there's not, it's not on people's mind or it's a situation where um, it's not talked about? So I find that's one major thing that's a problem is just, you know, in our workplace or, you know, in my experience, it's something that's not even discussed. So an example that I have is um, one of my colleagues on another campus. Um, she happened to be um, training a person that wasn't on the same level as far as her, the, her role is. And through conversation, this um, gentleman happened, and she's female, happened to mention his salary. And she was floored to learn that his salary was higher than hers, and he wasn't, didn't have a job that compared to hers. So in that conversation, he also told her that he was not supposed, like he was a little taken aback by him even saying it, and that he was instructed not to mention what his salary was in any conversation. And so, you know, again, that's that piece for me where people, if it's, you know, if it's something that's not discussed, how can one really know if they're not getting paid as they should? I mean, granted, you come in and you, you, um, negotiate salaries, but when you find out even colleagues in your same role with the same degree, or even someone in a lesser role per se, that's making more money than you, then, you know, and, but don't know about it, that's an issue. That's an issue. 
So that that's been my, you know, kind of secondhand experience. But, you know, overall looking at just now reflecting on, you know, the going ons in the organization, that's pretty much what happens. Like it's, you know, it's not talked about um, any type of additional funds or monies that's granted to individuals is not discussed. You can't celebrate it. I'm not telling my colleague, oh, guess what? I just got an extra 5%, but you're not doing that. So um, that's been my experience in that situation for that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. I loved the wording, floored to learn about the inequity. <laughs> Yes. That this woman experienced. To say the least. <laughs> right, right. I'm sure um, many people on this on this call who've joined us have have had a similar similar experience. Um, but I also want to pull up something I thought you said that was so interesting that there's a lack of conversation around around pay and how that can contribute to these inequities and also that you mentioned it's not on a lot of people's minds. Now, I wonder whose who's minds it's on and whose minds it's not on, right? I think that many of us, um, it, is, it is on a lot of people's minds unless you yourself probably are not experiencing this inequity, right? And so, yeah, so maybe I misspoke in that respect, meaning it's, 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 been my experience in the culture of not to talk about it. So while it may be on people's minds, it's not fostered to really, you know, dig into why it's not equal pay or even question why. Because again, if you don't know that you're not getting paid equally or, you know, compared to another colleague that has similar experience and degrees, it, it's just not discussed. It's mm -hmm. just not discussed. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great way of putting it. Thank you so much. And um, to Rihas, what, um, what barriers to equal pay have you seen in your various workplaces? Hi, everyone. Um, I, I work in the tech industry and currently I've worked at a large company in their tech division and currently I'm at a smaller startup. And I think one thing I've noticed that is a barrier and for me and I think a lot of other women would be the idea of mentorship and sponsorship within the company. Um, that's been a huge barrier. Usually I think a lot of people that I've observed who have excelled or heard about excelling have done so through having strong sponsorship at certain levels, exec levels, and those individuals have been male colleagues and so forth, right? And so, you know, I have had an experience where both myself and another colleague who was male started the same day at a company on the same team and close to promotion time, you know, our manager was having conversations with this individual about performance review and, um, you know, promoting to the next level, but those conversations weren't occurring with myself. And so, you know, I found out because, the, you know, we were really good friends and he kind of mentioned it. And so I came up with my own strategy of how I was planning to negotiate um, when performance came around because that conversation wasn't being initiated from, you know, my manager. So really just, I think, observing ways in which women or you know companies structure mentorship and sponsorship within their companies I think can make a big difference I've seen it help you know you don't know what you don't know and so if you have a mentor or someone looking out for you they can tell you oh you, if you want this sort of opportunity exists at the company if you want to be able to do this reach out to this person it's hard especially if you're at a big company need to be able to navigate those type of things so I think that's a huge barrier. And I think also within tech, a lot of VPs or exec tend to be male. And so there's also this idea of, you know, at least for myself going in, there's also this level of, I think, intimidation of how to approach them to seek that kind of um, relationship in terms of mentorship, right? You don't really see that many people who look like you're or represent your background in this industry. So I think also trying to figure out how to sort of have that support because it can 
make a huge difference in your career and your pay and the opportunities you have um, is one barrier I've noticed. And then another one I would say on a higher level is um, like governmental changes, right? I think one in some states, I think New York is one where the change was that people couldn't ask for your salary history. And that actually was a huge benefit for me um, in job search, right? Where I was able to jump by a certain percentage when I started to find a new company because I couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't ask about the salary history and I didn't reveal. And so that I think that, you know, that benefit of you know that government or state laws that implemented oh you can't um, inquire about salary history I think um, is good and I think more um, governmental you know great if companies can you know move in alignment but I think having more larger policy in place can definitely be beneficial in sort of helping you navigate ways to sort of um, improve your salary in different ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Trihas. And you know what, what you shared about how difficult it can be to find out some of this information or to have some of this guidance if you don't have a sponsor or mentor is so reflective of what we hear so many men, so many women who we work with tell us that particularly if you're in an industry or field where there aren't as many people who look like you who share your same experiences or backgrounds. Um, it can be very lonely and it can be a blow to confidence sometimes. So if there's not something formal in place, it can be hard to have that, the benefits of having a mentor or a sponsor. Um, and Nupur, um, what barriers to equal pay have you seen in your workplace? Yeah, um, I think there's, bunch of good points that resonate with me that have already been um, brought up. So I'll chime into some of those. Um, the, the first one being that mentorship aspect. Um, I think we all know that it's really important to advocate for ourselves and ask for those raises and um, kind of do the research to figure out if we're being paid fairly or not, but that can only get us so far sometimes. Um, with, without the proper information, the proper research tools, um, and the proper um, tools within our company to kind of affect that change. So you can ask for a raise, but there's no guarantee that you'll get it. There's no guarantee that HR or the CEO or whoever's in charge will be able to grant you that wish. Um, so I think that's where having mentors in senior positions at a company to advocate for you is very important. Um, and I've gone through instances where sometimes even that's not enough, but at least you don't feel alone. Like you said, you don't feel isolated. You feel that there are people that are, are helping you um, get to where you need to be. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that um, a, a big barrier that I've seen is that lack of transparency. Um, not knowing what your colleagues make. And I've been in situations where the company has actually told employees that we're not allowed to share our salaries and our bonus levels. And me being very young at the time and so used to following the rules, I was not sharing anything. I was not asking anybody anything. And then come to find out a few years later, all of my male colleagues already knew how much each other was making. They had been talking about it. And it was just something that, I thought I shouldn't be doing it. So um, it felt wrong to share it. Um, but I've also been in situations where after that, where the company has said, you're free to share what, what you make with, with your colleagues. And that just felt so freeing. And it felt like the company was, was looking out for its employees. Um, so I've seen kind of both sides of the coin there. Hmm. And I know some of you have bridged um, different industries in your careers. Have you seen any, any differences um, in terms of fields that you were in, even the size of your organizations in the past that you think had an influence on pay equity? Yeah, those, those differences I just mentioned actually, I think were due to the size of the company. Um, the smaller company that was kind of just starting out, they were, 
limiting us a little bit more on how much we could share with each other. Potentially they didn't have the budget to pay people maybe what was market rate at the time. Um, whereas my company now is a very big company, um, pretty well known. And I think that they might have more of an obligation to kind of show that they're more open about these sort of things um, and, and trying harder to, to get to some sort of pay equity. Uh, Dr. Hampton or Tarihas, did you have any um, insights into differences in terms of fields or industries that you've worked in in the past? Um, so I've worked in the nonprofit sector before tech. I did a um, career switch through with the support of AAUW um, Career Development um, Fellowship. And I think um, in general, in the nonprofit sector, there's more conversations um, around it, especially the organizations that I worked with. So I think I was definitely more aware of my salary, my colleague's salary, um, what, what salary would be expected at the next role than I think I'm able to navigate within the tech industry a little bit uh, more. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. Um, for me, there wasn't a because I was in a different role, and again, I came from like being an, an adjunct professor to the role I'm in now for the most part. So the difference, though, that I do see is the, the level. So as an adjunct, we spoke more to each other about you know what we made and how you know what each other made. But um, at this level that I am now, it's more hush hush. Um, not sharing, less transparency. So that's one difference that I see from, from a different perspective from one role to the next. But I haven't seen as far as any uh, comparison between this organizational sizes um, that has affected me personally, but there is a difference, um, I think, in the conversations that people have according to their role at the organization. Mm -hmm. And, and speaking of different roles and organizations, what do you think is one step, just one step a manager could take that may have an immediate impact on the work-life balance for an employee or, or even their pay? So uh, you're directing this towards me? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's a good segue. So for, um, Right now, since you know the pandemic has happened, um, you know everyone was working from home, right? And so now it's we're kind of easing back into opening up fully, um, and so these conversations have were you know were being had by the the um, faculty and their managers as to what that would look like. So I think it's, it has come to some type of compromise where, you know, you want the people to come back. You don't want someone to quit, um, you know, and at the same time, people need their, you know, their pay. So it's come to a point where they've kind of negotiated or, and even as a manager, I agree as well, certain days they can come in just to teach the class or just to have office hours and then some days stay home so it's a little balance that way so some days on campus now while they're home they're still working from home but i think it eases up some of the pressures of always just having to go into work some of them still have small children at home so that's affecting them um, where certain daycares and schools aren't open fully. And so they cannot, you know, just put their children somewhere for the whole entire day. So I think there's, it's been a compromise and it's so far it's been working. And I feel like people are being more productive um, that way because they're having almost the best of both worlds where they can come in and do what they need to do as well as at home, but it gives them a little bit flexibility to manage their, their life at home as well. Thank you, thank you. And let's see, Tarihas, I think you had indicated you had something to share there. Um, a step a manager can take to improve the work-life balance of an employee um, or even reducing their pay gap. Um, so I think it similarly aligns with what Sandra was saying. I think um, what I've observed, especially with the teams, that I currently um, have is that 
a lot of the times having the mindset of focusing more on like deliverables and expectations and making sure those are met so much more and I think the hours being clocked um so I sometimes and understanding that you know even with with the pandemic or afterwards right people have a lot going on and I think if we think about women or women who have families and children, um, those lives are being merged a lot at this moment. And so I've had members who have asked for like mental health health day and I'm like, okay, sure, great. You know, and I know that they're gonna meet their expectation and deliverables, you know? And so the thought that, you know, people work between the certain hours, nine to five, you know, I've, I know some, some people work on the weekends on my team, even though that's not expected, that's just their preference or even at night. So I think having that mindset that people, um, you know, trust in your team that they will get the work agreed on, done, and that allowing, I think, for more flexible time or doing certain things async. Um, I think that's also a, a one that I've observed, like if certain conversations can definitely be async, it allows some people on the team to not have to be that person that always has to say, oh, I can't make it. And then you become single adult, right? Oh, I, you know, oh, I have to leave early to go pick up my, you know, to, to go pick up someone from daycare or anything like that. If you know, you can schedule around certain times or schedule around um, or make, you know, conversations async. So I think the flexibility piece is something um, I think is important too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Nipur? Yeah, I think um, something important for managers to do for work-life balance is um, show, don't tell. You can, you can tell your direct reports to take vacation. You can tell them it's okay to work flexible hours, but sometimes if they don't see you doing the same, they might feel that it's not okay, like my manager's not taking time off or my manager's going on vacation, but answering emails and calls the whole time, they'll feel like that's something they need to do as well. So as a manager, something really important you can do is say, I'm taking this week off and I'm only answering emergency emails or emergency phone calls. Other than that, you won't hear from me. Um, and then you feel like your team will feel also okay that they can maybe next month do a very similar thing, get that well-deserved time off that they need and, and not feel bad about it or, or not feel like um, they're doing something that's going against kind of the, the way that the team works as a whole. So um, yeah, as a manager demonstrating the behavior, behaviors that you wanna show your team is okay um, is very important. And I think we'd love to hear about any success stories that you all have seen or have been a part of at your in your careers in terms of seeing colleagues or even yourselves or for people you've hired and managed, how they've been able to negotiate for higher pay or something similar. Dr. Hampton. Um, so I'll go. So I manage um, adjuncts and at our institution, we call them visiting professors. And so um, just to kind of piggyback off of what Nipur said um, to model the behavior. Right. So often um, because I because um, adjuncts are typically at a set, you know, salary, um, usually non-negotiable pretty much. Um, and it, compared to the um, local, other local uh, institutions, ours are slightly, we slightly pay our slightly le less money, right, than the other. So we're not as competitive as far as, you know, getting those in because of the surrounding institutions. So what I try to do is to, you know, do things where they can, you know, get extra pay to bring them up to what a level, according to their work, of course, to a level where I think they should be. And so I kind of, you know, kind of embed that in them to always be an advocate for themselves. And, you know, some of them would just almost do anything I would ask them to do. But, you know, with that, 
it's like you have to be your own advocate and ask, like, if I'm doing this, am I going to get this, you know, paid for my work or, you know, things like that. For me, I didn't, I didn't mind them doing that. Like, I encourage that, you know, if this is something that you think you're doing outside of your job description and that you feel as though you should get paid for it, then by all means, say that. And I'm, I'm there for you. I'm there trying to get it. So fast forward, I had one of my VPs roll over into a, uh, a different position at another institution and had to negotiate for some, you know, pay and felt very comfortable with those types of conversations that she had to have with her manager. So, you know, I wanted to take a little credit for that, <laughs> for giving her that person that, you know, that, that courage to even, you know, think that she can do that. So I guess that would be my little success story. <laughs> I love that. And how you were able to work with someone to give them that confidence and yeah. having that conversation, those conversations are hard. And that's one of the strategies our Work Smart Online trainings really focuses on is how to create that confidence in yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, Dr. Hampton did give it to others as well. I think that's so important. Um, Tarihas or Nupur, do you have any success stories that you'd like to share thinking back to times when, when you've managed people and maybe played a role in their advancement? Yeah, I have um, a story I like to share. Um, so in the when I've been um, a manager, I tend to be very um, clear and open about the salary and what's um, in the budget for a salary. And so I had a report T who, when she started, um, we had agreed on a, you know, I shared what the budget was. We had an agreement at the beginning and within the six months, I noticed that she was overperforming, over excelling um, beyond expectation. And so decided that, you know, I did, this wasn't someone I wanted to lose. I know that she could easily find an opportunity somewhere and having conversations with HR and then the VP of program to figure out how we could um, give her an, a pr promotion within um, the one year coming up um, to make sure that she was a talent that we could keep. So I think for myself, it, it's always about um just being honest I think with people I manage in terms of salary I think it's disappointing from the experience I've had when you realize that you've been sort of lowballed I mean that's never a good experience and people tend to leave um very fast even if you try to make it up in the end I think that distaste is always there and so from my approach has always been to um have a straightforward negotiation and then um, if I see that someone is really excelling above having conversations ongoing conversations with them about their performance and uh, what you know opportunities salary wise or otherwise they would want um, in order for us to keep their talent. Um, one story that I um, know of also is um, a a colleague of mine also had a reportee um, who came in low. Um, he didn't negotiate and, and they sort of offered a very low salary. And um, the manager kind of realized that this person is really talented, could definitely do well and beyond. So really coach the person on the different skill sets that they could um, acquire to be able to move to a senior level to double their salary. Um, that was a conversation they had as a one and a half year sort of strategy for this person. And that exactly is what happened, right? The person left that part of the organization for a new role on a different team, but was able to double their salary within a year and a, and a half, right? And so, you know, that's why I'm very, a big advocate of mentorship and sponsorship, just as a manager, if you're able and you know of opportunities and you know of good, good talent, um, advocating for them and then all, you know, and allowing them to be able to either double their salary or get other, other opportunities to grow their career. Um, so those are sort of stories I've had within my experience as a manager and also observing how other managers have um, sort of supported their team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And, and Nippur. Um, yeah, some, something that um, uh, a company I worked at did was a salary benchmarking exercise, which was a very interesting thing. I think a lot of employees at the company felt that they were getting underpaid, but there was no way to really like prove it. And the company took it upon themselves to do the research and figure out what the market rates were for almost every single role, um, whether it was in accounting or engineering or, or some other department. Um, and that exercise revealed that there was a gap between what people at the company were getting paid and what they should have been getting paid um, compared to other companies in um, similar industry or other similar roles. Um, and they were able to bump a lot of people up to the salary they should have been at. And um, I was a manager at the time. It was actually my first time seeing the salaries of some of my direct reports. I didn't even know how much my people were making, um, but it gave me the chance to kind of look at their performance, um, their years of experience and other uh, criteria. And with, within a very well-defined range, such as this is their, if they're a level one engineer, their salary should be between X and uh, Y thousand dollars a year. And it was kind of like a scale that I was able to place them at to make sure that it was done fairly. It was of course reviewed by many other people. Um, and basically what it resulted in was like significantly improved morale um, and it supported uh, employer retention as well. People were much less likely to go leave for another company that could offer them more because now they were getting offered um, the amount of money that they should have been. So I, I thought that was a great um, success for the company. Thank you. And I see we have a number of questions and people who've raised their hands. Kate, um, are there any questions that those who are attending would like to ask the panelists? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you to the panel. This is really useful um, information. Um, I've enjoyed hearing your perspectives. Um, and we have a few great questions. Um, the first one is about the ability of managers to discontinue practices. Um, if it's possible to, um, how, how to create change within your organization and stop practices in particular, the one they're asking about is that um, some companies dissuade their employees from discussing salary. Um, and before we launch into that, I do wanna make it clear that that is illegal. It is illegal for employers to prohibit um, workers from discussing their salaries. Um, this question specifically says that at some companies it's a fireable offense. And again, I want to be clear, that is illegal, <laughs> um, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and I know that a lot of companies take steps to discourage it. Um, it's not discourage, it's not illegal to discourage something, um, but I, I want to be clear and spread that knowledge. Um, yes, it is illegal in every state. It is illegal under federal law. Um, <laughs> some states specifically have laws that allow for it, um, which uh, is helpful in educating. Um, and companies certainly have ways of um, sort of getting around it and, as I said, discouraging it. But it is illegal to flat out prohibit it. Um, so. With, with that caveat in mind, I wanna turn it over to our panel to discuss any tricks or tips you have on how to discontinue um, practices or sort of change culture. Well, I could, I could say for me, I guess it would be just to, you know, again, when I personally never had it to told to me, but someone in my organization has um, on at their camp campus. So I guess what I could say as far as how to change it is just to ask the questions, why, why can't we discuss, you know, because again, often, I think Nepur said this, um, you know, someone tells you something, you just follow the rule <laughs> because that's what, you know, you're new. And so you kind of want to just do what you think everyone else is doing. And so if it's not, if you never have anyone come up to you and talk about a salary, then you think, well, maybe that's what it's, that's what it is here. That's the culture. 
So I guess if, if that was ever a situation for me where someone literally told me not to discuss it and well now I know it's illegal, that's a whole nother conversation, but I would ask literally, well, why not? You know, I'll throw the ball back in their court. Well, why not? Why can't, why is it a culture where we can't discuss it? Like what, what's behind that? Because for me, if you if there's a lack of transparency, then there's a reason why you don't want people to know. And then I think it leads into you know, people questioning why they're not getting paid like they should be getting paid. So I think it makes it's more of a comfort level for them to create the culture of of not of people not discussing. But I guess to answer your question, it would be for me to just ask the, the questions of why we can't or what you know what's behind that that thought of not discussing uh, salaries amongst colleagues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's... Sorry. Please go ahead, Nipur. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say, yeah, I think that's great. I think that if I had asked why sooner, it, it probably would have come about. Other people would have started talking about it, and we would have realized that maybe there, this is a red flag, or maybe there's something behind this that's maybe being hidden that that we need to uncover, and it um, uh, it would have helped us sooner sooner on. Yes, it was in, it was discouraged. It wasn't like flat out said that you cannot do this. But I do remember getting any time we got a raise or anything like that in the letter we got, it said, do not share with colleagues. So um, yeah, I, I think that um, changing it, I think it, it requires a discussion maybe at a certain like lower manager level and then bring it up higher through the ranks until it reaches um, whoever it is that's setting these policies. I, I think getting the discussion going is, is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I also just love the way Dr. Hampton um, recommended approaching the conversation, just neutral, why, you know, and, and that's part of our salary negotiation trainings. So you don't have to be competitive, right, when you're having these difficult conversations, but curious and matter of fact, just, just as men have been doing for decades when they're doing their own negotiations, right? Um, Kate, any other questions from those attending? Yeah, we've had a few around um, mentorship. Uh, I think that that's a really interesting point that you all brought up, um, but uh, I want to flag, this is so, sort of a comment slash question, but in how to get a mentor outside of your industry where you're employed, or I would broaden that to be outside of your um, direct employer. And if any of you can speak to the importance of having different kinds of mentors who can fill different roles, um, and, and help you navigate different areas? Yeah, so um, I usually, my approach with mentorship is that I usually don't like ask, I just kind of sneakily make the person my mentor, but I just always having follow-up questions <laughs> and feedback. So then over, over time, and you know, these relationships take time. Over time, you just enter into that type of relationship where um, this person knows that you'll come to them with advice, you follow up on the advice, and then you'll let them know how it worked out for you. And it's a two-way street, right? If you know that your mentor and always, you know, realize that they might be working on something, right? One of my mentor, um, she wanted to start like a a sort of a leadership program for young girls. And I worked in the nonprofit sector and did youth development. And so I sort of had tips for her of how to go about that. And um, so, you know, it could be nothing, you know, and she was a mentor for tech. So you could just figure out the different things they have going on and see if you have any feedback and where you can plug in. And I think that's where it becomes, you know, big or small, you know, um, I think that's where it becomes sort of that mutual benefit thing, but I think that's how I tend to get it. I usually find someone that I think has experience or something, and then I just reach out for questions and then go from there. I do, and I do think that's important to have different times, type of mentors outside, but I do think that when you're at a company and especially a company that you want to grow within, 
it's definitely important to figure out how to get not only a mentor, but a sponsor, someone who's really at a certain level that can that knows the ins and outs of the company that can share information with you, because otherwise it becomes challenging to just know what exists or what you can or cannot do or how to even get from one level to another, right? I, I've been at a company where it took me months just to figure out how things operated and it was just hard to get conversations with people. And so if you have a sponsorship, they provide that information for you, right? If you wanna get involved in another area in the company, they know exactly what's going on there, the initiative, the projects, who's leading it. Um, otherwise, you'll spend time on LinkedIn just researching who's doing what at the same company you work at. <laughs> and then to go from there and figuring out how to even approach this person or what the projects are. Um, so I think having someone at the company, especially if it's a company you want to grow at and increase your salary and increase your role is important to figure out. It's definitely, I think, a challenge depending on your industry and your company. Um, so I definitely always think like, trying to figure out how to definitely just have sponsorship in your industry, regardless of whether or not they work at your company, but also trying to figure out someone um, who can be your advocate at your company um, is also helpful as well. Thank you, Dr. Hampton or Nupur, anything to add there? Um, I will just say that I've actually found LinkedIn very useful. Um, th there are ways to search for um, people who are at companies that maybe have like one or two connections off from you that you can maybe get someone else to introduce you to them if they're, if they're at a company you're interested in applying to or a role that's interesting to you that maybe you um, want to be in in three to five years. Um, I think that it doesn't hurt to send a message uh, if that option is available to you. The worst thing is that they just don't respond. Um, so you can you can kind of do what you wish with with that. Thank you. And, and for me, for our organization, they because there are multiple campuses across the United States, they like everything to be consistent. So. This is one good thing I, I liked about the organization is that they literally put you in contact with people that are more senior than you are um, to kind of show you the ins and outs. That, that's the go-to for any questions that you may have if you're troubleshooting or can't figure out what to do or in, under certain situations. So that's the one thing was that was attractive to um, about this organization is that they're very supportive that way as far as mentorship is, is concerned. Um, as far as the, you know, the understanding the ins and outs of the job. Thank you. Kate, I think we probably have time for, for one more question. Was there another? Yeah, um, this is a not so hypothetical hypothetical that um, <laughs> I think would be useful um, to reflect upon. Um, one of our participants today is in her first job um, and she negotiated her salary um, and then found out that the current position play, pays a maximum of about $20,000 more than what she was hired for. Um, so she's hoping, she was just hired this past August and she's hoping to speak to her supervisor in March about a raise. Um, and she's wondering for some, about some tips on how to go about that. Um, what I do um, is like documentation is a huge part of how I try to approach this. Um, really, since you've started, you started in August, really document um, ways in which you're adding value and impact, right? And adding value and impact to, for your manager, value and impact for your team, but also the bottom line business. Um, and that is how the business make money. So how, and you can, how is it that the work that you're doing is helping your company either make more money or save more money, I think is a good way to sort of think about it. And so really write it down, document it. And, you know, from now until March, 
um, if you haven't been thinking in that way, figure out ways in which you can either be on projects that align with those, um, you know, but I feel like, and maybe other people can speak when it comes to these conversation, it's always, and I think that this is advice I got from a mentor. It's also what, is, what value are you adding and from a business perspective and the bottom line perspective, right? Um, and I, yeah, that would be my advice is just really think about the work that you're doing, how you're making your manager's life easier, but also how are you adding or saving um, the company money <laughs> at the end. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, you were in my head because that's exactly what is, is needed. Um, and nothing's too small to document. Um, that was the advice given to me as well. Like document everything that you do and let them decide whether or not it's not worth the value, but definitely put it down. Um, because small things that may seem like that's something we should just do, like it's a no brainer, um, may add a value or maybe something that someone else never even thought about doing. So I, I definitely agree with that. I, I, I can't even say any more than what she said it perfectly, like definitely document. Um, and these are conversations just to, sh you can show people sometimes better than you can tell them. So this is what I have done over X amount of years or months. Um, and then that will be the spark of the conversation or that segue into you negotiating for more money. Um, yeah, and I like that. Oh, sorry. No, I was, I was just, just oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just gonna add to the small. Like, for example, if if you offer um interview assistance to H um to recruiters, so let's say the recruiter asks you to say you know help with interviewing, that's also something that helps with the the, the bottom line, right? You're helping bring great talent into the company. Document that, that you spend time giving the service to the recruiters at your company to help um, interview different candidates. So anything that you're doing, just find the way to add in value, even if it's bringing in talent, and write it down. So that's it. <laughs> Uh, the, the only other thing I would add is sometimes roles like this, this there is like a, a low end and a high end, um, depending on experience and whatnot. So another way that you can um, go into this conversation is to say, like, what what does your supervisor recommend you you learn? What skills should you take up to to be able to get to that higher end of that salary range? Um, so not only documenting for sure what you've done and and how you've contributed, but also um, asking about ways that you can continue to to develop yourself to get to where you want to be. Thank you so much, everyone, for your insights. Um, We've heard a number of things that people on the call can do today to reduce the pay gap in their, in their own lives for their careers and for those women who come up beside and behind them. Um, documentation, taking advantage of or proactively seeking mentors or sponsors who can demystify the process of getting ahead in a particular organization, right? Or, or know how to advocate for yourself or others. And then that's also related to what we can do systemically um, to contribute to systemic changes to reduce the pay gap. Um, Kate, anything else you want to add before we sign off today and thank our panelists for joining us? Well, first, uh, just a huge thank you um, to our panelists for both a great discussion, but really just actionable, tangible things um, to take away. I think Shana just gave a very nice summary of that. Um, I also want to thank our participants for some really nice questions um, and for, for weighing in and being a part of this conversation. Um, when I reflect on what we heard in the first conversation um, with employees in comparison to this conversation with managers, I hear a lot of similar things themes just in terms of transparency and how important it is to be transparent in this process um, at all different levels and the, the cultural change that's needed to make that happen. Um, I also want to lift up one thing that Shana just said that also came through in our questions and comments, um, and that's the notion that 
a lot of this onus, the onus to fix the pay gap seems to be on individuals when it really is a systemic issue. Um, so the work that we can do collectively to push for change, I think is really important to take the onus off of the individuals. So that means larger cultural change within organizations and banding together, it might mean unionizing. Um, that also means pushing for legislative change. Um, at this point, there's a number of states that have banned the use of salary history in the hiring process, and that goes really far. Um, so I, I encourage folks to look within their smaller communities to think about how they can make collective change and then work with organizations like AUW or others that are working on deeper systemic change. Um, so this doesn't feel like something that you're going alone at. But um, with that, I wanna say thank you again, Shana, thank you for leading a great discussion. Thank you to our three panelists. Thank you for our participants. And I hope everyone will join us in December for our third panel in this series, talking with executives and leaders about their experience um, on closing the pay gap. Thanks everyone.